Uh, thanks, Corey, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the thermal corner protection uh, design and detailing requirements. So we'll go through that. Again, I'm Jeff Garrison. Uh, um, I've been in the uh, working for CBI for 32 years, and I've been involved in low time crouch and tank engineering for about 20 years now. Uh, talk about the thermal corner protection. You've heard a little bit about this. You've seen this picture before. But again, the thermal corner protection is, um, well, at least the definition of it in the code is insulated and liquid tight system to protect the outer tank corner joint from thermal shock. And again, that applies as, as Rolf indicated uh, to a uh, monolithic joint between the concrete slab and the concrete wall. The uh, thermal corner protection uh, and secondary bottom consists of the horizontal embed shown here uh, the vertical horizontal plate and vertical plate, and finally the secondary bottom. Um, so then well, along with the insulation behind that serves to protect this joint uh, during a spill condition that is in the annular space. Uh, one other advantage of this secondary bottom is that it does provide protection if you do have a small spill that, that could then boil off and not cause any damage, further damage to the wall or the liner, the carbon steel liner. And it also serves to protect the, uh, the foundation from the cryogenic temperature during the spill condition, including the, uh, the piles or potentially isolators um, that, that may be used in projects like John Powell described. Uh, just a little bit uh, before we get on to the, the TCP and the embedment, we'll talk a little bit about, about the spill condition. The outer concrete containment is designed to contain the refrigerated liquefied gas in the unlikely event that the inner tank should uh, leak into the uh, annular space. Uh, the concrete wall within the outer concrete containment spill zone, and the spill zone is defined as the location from the top of the TCP to the full spill height, uh, needs to be designed uh, to contain the product. And the way that's done is to provide a compression zone during the spill condition of at least 10% of the wall section thickness or three and a half inches as, as defined in ACI 376. And also within that compression zone or within, yeah, within that compression zone, we need to maintain an average compression stress of 145 uh, pounds per square inch. Uh, based on that, with that, well, the tank will remain liquid tight and substantially gas tight during the uh, spill, spill event. Now in this analysis, in this spill analysis, we need to consider, you know, a multiple range of, of spills, including a low spill, which would be at the TCP uh, embed location, and then a full spill, which should obviously be the full spill when the inner tank um, contacts fully uh, empties into the annular space. And then also you need to consider intermediate spills that, that will produce the most severe effect on the embedment and the concrete wall. And I provided this sketch here to kind of give a little more scale. This would be about 160 proportions for 160,000 cubic meter tank and the uh, depth of the spill that we're considering. The uh, spill analysis needs to consider the thermal effect, the transient thermal uh, uh, that occurs during the spill as it occurs and as the outer tank fills up through the steady state. And then we also we have to run a structural nonlinear finite element analysis, considering all the spill levels uh, for the transient uh, thermal conditions and the steady state as well. And the, the, the analysis will confirm the wall compression zone and the compression stress in that spill zone as dictated by the code. And finally, we're going to need to confirm the concrete rebar stress in the wall as well as crack width in the embedment zone, which we'll get into. Uh, this, this presentation is not really going to focus on the thermal corner protection and secondary bottom. It's going to focus more on the embedment zone and the new rules that are in ACI 376 for the uh, uh, TCP embedment plate, rather. So the current version that's out in, in public use um, really doesn't have a lot as minimal requirements for the TCP embedment plate. And we recognize that, so we're going we're gonna to fix that, obviously. And, and so we had, for the minimum, minimum embedment plate size really wasn't specified for the attachment requirements, the studs really not specified. What was specified and recognized was that we wanna control the crack width above the embedment zone so that product can't leak behind that and then further down towards the, 
the monolithic joint. So we did we did uh, have a uh, requirement of uh, maximum crack width in this embedment zone, which is defined as two times the wall thickness above the uh, embedment plate, and the maximum crack width in that zone needs to be 0 0.008 inches or 0.2 millimeters within that embedment zone. Uh, in the new version, which will be coming out uh, here shortly in the near future, um, we, we recognize that liquid tightness needs to be considered by the around in above and, and around the TCB embedment. Uh, finite element analysis needs to be performed to determine the crack with, you know, the spill condition analysis, and also to confirm the gap that the gap between the the embedment plate and the um, concrete wall itself. Um, we've come up with four TCP embedment configurations, which uh, I'll describe. And the configurations are basically designed to ensure that the product that should enter through cracks up above the TCP embedment will basically warm as they move down through the, uh, through the wall um, into a gaseous state, eliminating flow ensuring that liquid product does not flow behind the TCP and into the, uh, into the lower portion of the wall. Uh, TC embedment plate, it needs to be configured as well to be tight, uh, to provide, provide a tight seal between the embedment plate and the concrete wall itself. Um, one thing that we recognize is that uh, the target uh, maximum crack width is 0 0.008 inches as discussed, which is 0.2 millimeters. And this is regarded as that, that theoretically flow of the RLG product theoretically won't flow through a crack that's um, that has a maximum size of 0 0.008 inches. It's also understood that uh, achieving this maximum crack with a 0 0.008 inches cannot always be achieved um, in these wall locations because you have got really high forces due to the thermal effect and also uh, you know heavy rebar. So sometimes it's not easy to achieve that crack with. So we've got some. Um, rules that in these locations we can allow a, a larger crack with but we recognize that the size of the tcp embed needs to increase to make sure that at one point we get to a crack with uh, no greater than 0 0.008 inches so that we can restrict the flow of the product um, potential leak in that location um, concrete crack with are, as, de as defined in the code, are, are defined uh, using BSEN 1992 uh, code, code crack with equations. So let's get into the uh, different configurations that um, we have considered um, in, the, in the new version of ACI 376, starting with uh, section 6331, configuration A. This is the, the narrowest embed pl plate, probably the most economical, but it's a little more stringent with respect to the requirements. So the minimum width of this plate is, is 18 inches. The embedment zone uh, is two times the wall thickness above the TCP horizontal plate. So it's located right here, if you can see my cursor. Um, the maximum crack width uh, with this configuration in the embedment zone is 0 0.008 inches. The maximum crack width behind the TCP embed plate is 0 0.008 inches. And the maximum gap between the embedment plate and the concrete wall is also restricted 0 0.008 inches. Also, uh, we recognize that we want to make sure that it, within this crack width zone, we, we um, you know, uh, minimize the amount of reinforcement in there so we don't allow laps on the, the vertical inside face uh, reinforcement to make sure that we get good consolidation and that our crack width calculations are accurate and not um, the uh, change by the fact that we have a bunch of uh, laps within that region. So there's no laps allowed within this region from the bottom uh, in the vertical inside face reinforcement from the bottom of the embed plate to the top of the embedment zone. One other thing to note that along with the rest of the TCP, the embed plate um, is made of cryogenic material, um, whereas the rest of the liner uh, can be made of carbon steel uh, material above and below the uh, the uh, uh, TCP embedment plate. So that's A. Now moving on to the B, um, we've got a minimum width of 24 inches now. So six inches above, one foot eight up, below, below the horizontal place. And then this allows the relaxed uh, crack width of 0 0.010 inches or 0.25 millimeters um, in the case where the 0 0.008 um, minimum or maximum crack width size cannot be achieved. 
So the, in this case, the maximum crack within the, in the TCP embedment zone is allowed to be 0 0.010 inches. Maximum crack width behind the embedment plate, uh, except for the lower six uh, inches, is allowed to be 0 .00, uh, 0 0.010 inches. And whereas in the six inches, the lower six inches, it's the requirement is 0 .008 inches, again, to make sure that the flow is stopped if it should get back there. Maximum gap between the embedment plate and the concrete wall is 0 0.010 inches um, in this portion, in the upper 12, and then uh, 0 0.008 inches again in the lower uh, six inches of this embedment plate uh, location. Again, lapping of the reinforced vertical inside face reinforcement is not allowed from the bottom of the embed plate to the top of the embedment zone. And again, the uh, TCP uh, embedment plate material is again uh, made of cryogenic material that is suitable for the uh, product temperature. Moving on, now we're getting again. We're we're basically moving to relaxing requirements for the crack width, but it 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 causes a penalty to the embedment zone, uh, or the embedment plate. And so we, now we've got we've got to uh, configuration C, where the minimum width is six inches plus the length on the wall. Uh, to a location where the biaxial, where we get biaxial compression. Now with the biaxial compression, we've got compression in both the horizontal and vertical direction. Um, that compression will restrict the flow uh, completely. So we're not really worried about crack width in this location where we get the biaxial compression. So again, we're using the 0 0.010 relaxed requirements above, including uh, the crack width in TCP embedment zone can be 0 0.010 inches. Uh, the, the crack with behind the TCB embed plate uh, down to a location where the biaxial compression in the wall is achieved can also be 0 0.010 inches. The maximum gap between uh, the embedment plate and the concrete wall is, uh, is allowed to be increased to 0 0.010 inches, but the maximum gap uh, within the uh, biaxial compression wall zone down here need, needs to be 0 .01, uh, 0 0.008 inches again. And again, lapping of the vertical inside face reinforcing because we're trying to control these crack widths uh, is not allowed from the bottom of the uh, embed plate to the top of the embedment zone. And of course, this embedment plate is made of cryogenic material as well. Finally, we move into the, the last configuration, which is 6331D. Um, this again, you know, moving towards uh, relaxing the requirements, but also ensuring that we don't get the uh, uh, product movement through the wall. So this is a two-piece two embedment plate configuration for the case where we cannot get the calculated crack width at all of 0 0.008 inches. Um, that can't be achieved. So um, in this, we um, in the TCP embedment zone, again, we've got uh, a maximum crack width of 0 0.010 inches. The maximum crack width behind the upper TCP embed, embed, embed plate is also 0 0.010 inches. Uh, the maximum gap between the upper embed plate and the concrete wall is 0 0.010 inches. The lower embedment plate is located where there is a biaxial compression in the wall, so down here. So we, this is pushed all the way down to where we finally get the biaxial compression, again, the area where it won't, uh, product that gets in there won't flow past there. The crack within the wall and between the upper and lower embed plates uh, doesn't need to really be considered at this point. Um, we need a, ma uh, a maximum gap between the lower embedment plate and the concrete wall um, also needs to be uh, 0 0.008 inches to make sure that no flow uh, occurs be between the, the wall and the embedment plate. And again, lapping of the vertical reinforcement in the crack, crack width control zone is not permitted. So from the bottom of the upper plate to the top of the embedment <coughs> zone is not allowed. And the, the, the upper and lower uh, TCP embedment plates here shown in yellow also have to be uh, cryogenic material, good for the product. And this plate right here, which either is kind of shown as an embedded, but also could be a liner plate, um, same, same as above, that needs to be cryogenic material because it, it, it's recognizing that, hey, we're pushing the compression, the location where we, can, where we don't need it to leak down low, but we want to make sure it doesn't, a uh, product doesn't get to uh, this plate and crack it and obviously compromise the, uh, 
the uh, TCP area. So this, this plate needs to be cryogenic material as well. <clears throat> okay, so now looking at the embed itself, um, we got to make sure that the gap, as I said, the gap between the embedment plate and the concrete wall needs to be limited to the, either the 0 0.008 inch requirement or the 0 0.010 uh, inch requirement, depending on the embedment plate configuration. The, uh, spill, the spill condition product pressure places load on the TCP embedment. So um, obviously the highest low vertical load or hydrostatic load downward on this and horizontal plate um, will be from the full spill condition. Uh, the embedment plate thickness and stud placement and stud design needs to ensure that the maximum gap can be maintained. And we need to design again for the full transient thermal history and for multiple spill heights, including the low at the TCP, intermediate spill heights and the full as well, full spill as well. So looking at it here, we just, um, we did a, you know, when we were looking at the rules for this, um, we did an analysis just to see <clears throat> what we're up against and would, can we make this in this, in this case, this is configuration A um, with an 18 inch uh, embed plate. Can we make this work, you know, and make sure that we, we can uh, minimize the gap between the, the wall and the embed plate to make sure it's less than 0 0.008 inches in case of configuration A. So here we ran the analysis and you can see here, we've got a side view and this obviously doesn't hold, have the whole TCP here, but we, you see the horizontal plate and the vertical plate of the uh, TCP. And you can see that the effect of the vertical load on the TCP and uh, horizontal plate causes it to push downward and rotate the, the embed plate uh, in this location here. So obviously what that causes is that the, the embed plate to pull out up here and then also to uh, press against the wall here. And this, this view kind of shows uh, the way the, the, the plate is moving um, in between the stud attachments. And obviously this, these uh, the movements or these displacements have been exaggerated just to show the effect of the, uh, the spill on this horizontal plate and the TCB embedment plate. So some of the observations here is that uh, you know, this, this, this analysis shown here is based on the full spill condition. Um, Jeff, you need to wrap up in one okay, minute. We have Thanks. three rows of studs considered for anchoring the embedment plate to the wall. So we got a stud here and two down here. Uh, the bottom portion of the embedment plate is clamped to the wall by the rotation of the TCP horizontal plate. The upper portion of the embedment plate does pull away from uh, the wall between the studs, but the gap is less than the max allowable gap. And uh, we need to consider all, all conditions because in this case, we don't really need the three studs. But for the other cases of low energy intermediate spills, it comes evident that you do need the three studs. Uh, obviously, this needs to be worked out by the contractor or the designer of the tank to make sure that they've designed the, uh, the embed plate to make sure that we don't get um, big gaps in there that violate the code.